first became engrossed by the French Revolution when, as an undergraduate at the University of Melbourne in 1968, I bought a paperback copy of George Riday's study of the crowd in the French Revolution. The book had rapidly become a classic because it was seen to give agency and faces to those in the insurrections which played determining roles in the key junctures of 1789 and after, but which for so long had been dismissed as amorphous mobs. For a young left-wing student in the heady days of 1968, Riday's book was an inspiration for the possibilities of studying history from below. Rude, born in Oslo in 1910, uh, had moved to London with his Norwegian engineer father and English mother in 1919. He graduated in languages from Cambridge in 1931 and becoming politically committed, joined the British Communist Party in 1935, following a trip to the Soviet Union. Rude taught languages in private schools until he was dismissed in 1949, apparently after the parent of one of his students saw him at a communist protest march. He set off for Paris to further his postgraduate studies. Rude completed a PhD at the University of London in 1950, entitled The Parisian Wage Earning Population and the Insurrectionary Movements of 1789-1791. He drew intellectual sustenance from his membership of the Historians Group in the British Communist Party, meeting significant young scholars such as Christopher Hill, Rodney Hilton, and Eric Hobsbawm. His doctoral thesis was enriched by periods of further archival study in Paris, when his school teaching uh, responsibilities permitted, continued participation in Alfred Cobham's seminars at the University of London, and finally resulted in his first book, The Crowd in the French Revolution, published by Oxford University Press in 1959. In the preface to The Crowd, Rude thanked Alfred Cobham for his help and guidance but he primarily acknowledged his mentor, Georges Lefebvre, and especially his friends and collaborators, Richard Cobb and Albert Sobol. He described the book as part of a collective enterprise, one which was also to result in Sobol's thesis on the Parisian sans culotte and Cobb's study of the Armée Révolutionnaire, the civilian armies of sans culotte established in the second half of 1793. The Three Musketeers, as Rude, Sabul, and Cobb were known, and another English left-wing historian and friend, Eric Hobsbawm, were to have an enormous impact on the writing of history from the 1960s, opening up pathways to the writing of history from below, pivotal to the explosion of social history in the 1970s. Rude wore his political affiliations lightly, even though they at times had harsh consequences, including in Australia. In 1960, the Council of the University of Tasmania refused to app appoint him on the grounds that he was a communist. Rude was promptly offered a position at the University of Adelaide. And his decade there was to be the most productive of his life, as this mature scholar, who was by then more than 50 years old, made the most of his first academic appointment. In the 1960s, he published or completed no fewer than seven books on the French, British and European history including bestsellers such as Revolutionary Europe, 1783-1815, and uh, with Eric Hobsbawm, Captain Swing. Together with his 1988 textbook, Overview of the French Revolution, these volumes made George Rude one of the best-selling authors of all time on the period, and he has had a major impact on generations of students. As a Marxist historian, Rude's fundamental concern was to explore the ways in which the twin upheavals of the late 18th century, the Industrial Revolution and the French Revolution, radically transformed socioeconomic structures, transformed the nature of ruling elites and the social composition and collective protest of urban crowds. But how well have his books stood the test of time, particularly his explanation of the causes and course of 1789 in France and the role of popular upheaval? I'll begin with a discussion of Rude's treatment of Parisian crowds before turning to his general explanation of the revolution of 1789. The specific focus of the crowd was the menu peuple of Paris, a complex social grouping of shopkeepers, craftsmen, apprentices, skilled and unskilled wage earners, who together were perhaps two thirds of the city's population of approximately 650,000 people. Rude examined the ways in which at crucial moments, these working people, 
1791, the Sans-Culottes, outcry 1791, the Sans-Culottes, intervened to defend or extend the revolutionary movement in the years after 1789. And in the process, developed an egalitarian political ideology, essentially learnt from what he called the revolutionary bourgeoisie, which went far beyond the subsistence concerns, which continued to fuel their anger. Despite his deep knowledge of revolutionary Paris and meticulous use of archival material, Rude was criticised for an allegedly mechanistic Marxist model of the interaction between material and political motivations. The pre-revolutionary substance of popular attitudes was seen by critics to be rudimentary and devoid of enlightened precepts. In a chapter of the crowd, which he devoted to the motives of revolutionary crowds, he argued that, quote, revolutionary crowds enthusiastically supported and assimilated the objects, ideas, and slogans of sections of the revolutionary bourgeoisie. But these cannot be regarded as the particular demands of working people, which Rude saw as fundamentally about subsistence issues, in particular the price of bread. Without these external ideas, however, popular upheavals, he said, would have remained strangely purposeless and barren of result. The menu perp showed a capacity to both absorb and adopt such ideas, as the slogans of popular upheavals demonstrated in 1789, vive le roi, vive Necker, vive le tiers état, and liberté nous ne céderons pas. Rude seemed therefore to suggest that the sans culottes were dependent on the revolutionary bourgeoisie, both for leadership and for the ideas that took their subsistence concerns beyond the price and availability of foodstuffs. His later work became more subtle in its use of a dynamic interplay between perceptions and reality in popular ideology, showing how ideas derived from others were not simply adopted in their original form, but also adapted to particular uses. In The Crowd in History, written in 1964, Rude analysed brilliantly how rioting crowds manipulated their leaders, whether real or imagined, as a tactic of self-protection. Sometimes writers use the traditional tactic of self-protection by arguing that they believe that they are acting against merchants and bakers on the orders of the king, shouting, vive le roi. At other times, they thrust local office holders, such as mayors or priests to the fore, as a defensive tactic in case protests failed. The dynamic interplay between perceptions and reality was at the heart of Rude's Marxist conceptualization of the nature of popular ideology. He argued that, like other social groups, working people in town and country viewed the world through a set of inherent and derived perceptions, that is, of attitudes, values, and prejudices that they had absorbed with their mother's milk as members of particular social and occupational groups, which were constantly reinforced and modified by ideas derived from elsewhere, orally or through the written word. Profoundly influential, although the crowd has been. The changing approaches of historians over the past 60 years have inevitably highlighted shortcomings. Rude was later to fall out with Richard Cobb, who developed a distaste for ideologues, historians as much as revolutionary politicians, who claimed to speak for the masses and their supposed interests in ideology. He asserted that Rude had made horrific violence respectable by giving rioters names, addresses, and occupations, and of wanting, quote, the exhilaration of riot experienced in the safety of a record office. More importantly, it may be argued that Rude's quantitative focus uh, on the characteristics of violent conflict, uh, violent collective behavior, led him away from a deeper qualitative analysis of the cultural practice of violence. Sporadic though they may have been, Horrific instances of deliberate cruelty by rioting crowds have since attracted closer study. As scholar, uh, scholars have highlighted the importance of close-knit communities of place, faith and family, and examined the specificity of violent acts. Such analyses, such as those of Arlette Farge, have stressed the internal logic of crowd action by pointing to the symbolic rights of popular violence. Another shortcoming lies in Rude's focus on only the most famous you and me and their social composition and political consequences. In 1789, 
the Réveillon riots, the storming of the Bastille, and the October days. Far closer in actuality than the potent images of, of violent crowds were frequent peaceful demonstrations, petitions, banquets, and mass meetings. Michael Alpo have, has found that only 12% of an estimated 750 protests by Saint Culotte after 1789 resulted in physical violence. In his 1964 textbook, Revolutionary Europe, 1783-1815, Rude devoted a chapter to why was there a revolution in France? What was his explanatory model? After a masterful survey of classic explanations from Burke to Michelet and Tocqueville, Rude concluded with a common uh, Marxist model. In his words, economic hardship, social discontent, and the frustration of political and social ambitions. Uh, this, when infused with the revolutionary psychology of the Enlightenment, created a combustible combination, sparked into revolution by bankruptcy, aristocratic reaction, and royal mismanagement. It was a nuanced, well-informed argument. Rudet was careful to place the economic hardship of the 1780s in the context of earlier relative prosperity. He was well aware of the pre-industrial uh, social uh, structures of France and the dominance of the professions and property owners among the bourgeoisie rather than manufacturers and other capitalists. He insisted on the reality of seigneurialism and the feudal reaction. He was also careful to consider the ways in which the corrosive vocabulary of citizen, nation, social contract and rights was disseminated rather than painting philosophers as revolutionary themselves. When he returned to general questions in his last book, his 1988 overview entitled The French Revolution, he began with the same question, why was there a revolution in France? His argument was essentially the same, even word for word in places, but this time he took issue with some other historians, notably his old teacher, Alfred Cobbin. He specifically targeted Cobbin's 1964, The Social Interpretation of the French Revolution, written, argued Rude in a style characteristic of the author, as he laid about him with iconoclastic zest, slaying every would-be dragon or sacred cow that came within his sights. For Rude, Cobbin had caricatured the Marxist view of the nature and significance of the revolution. He had attacked the very uh, notion of feudalism and the feudal reaction, and especially the Marxist argument that this was a bourgeois revolution and connected with the rise of capitalism. It was, in Cobbins' words, a triumph for the conservative property landowning classes, large and small. To mix the metaphors, Rude accused Cobbin of throwing the baby out with the bathwater in his desire to attack Marxism-Leninism. Rude's willingness to accept research-based critique of his own work was tested by Cobbins' feisty tone. Rude also crafted some beautifully uh, balanced paragraphs on the dispute between François Furet and Claude Mazoric and the vitriol of the pre-bicentenary debates, looking forward to a new synthesis in a nice example of the Marxist dialectic. Most historians would today agree with Rude, if not in his particular terms, that the crisis of the Bourbon regime was the result of three linked causes, the increasing costs of empire, the failure of ruling elites to deal with the financial crisis emanating from involvement in the American War of Independence, and changes in the political culture and social assumptions that were undermining the legitimacy of absolute monarchy and aristocracy. Rude was well aware how this political culture was inextricably linked to an expanding Atlantic economy of trade in colonial produce, French manufactures and wine, and slaves. Historians of rural France today are also far more likely to agree with Rude than with Cobham uh, about the material substance of seigneurialism, although they would stress the great diversity of regional, judicial, social, and economic structures. The most significant historiographical development since Rude wrote has been in our understandings of the Enlightenment, away from traditional intellectual history to cultural history in the broad sense of the history of behaviors whether verbal, perceptual, or physical. Rather than the great writers of the late 18th century creating a revolutionary psychology, as in Rude's terms, 
We now study how the panoply of power enjoyed by the monarchy and its nobility had been corroded by interrelated economic, social, and cultural shifts, evident in changing material and political cultures. That is, the objects and practices of daily life and changing assumptions being made about legitimacy and opinion. Historians today are likely to be more nuanced and supple than Masrude about the relationship between economic and other cultural practices. They see the emergence of concepts such as despotism, rights, patriotism, public opinion, and nation as accompanying rather than reflecting the rise of a commercial and consumer culture, which if not a direct cause of the crisis, informed the political culture through which, through it, which it was expressed. We understand better the continued resonance of the Jansenist challenge, largely ignored by Rude. This uh, agitated political and commercial culture is also now far more likely to be seen from our own perspective of the globalizing world of the 21st century, rather than from the Atlantic perspective shared by Palmer and Godshaw and their Marxist critics, Rude and Hobsbawm. Some historians have even contested the centrality of the French Revolution to the Age of Revolutions. For example, Christopher Bailey has argued that the revolution was only part of an international crisis created by the imbalance between states' perceived military and imperial needs on the one hand, and their financial resources and expertise on the other. Dagger Armitage and Sanjay Subramanian have described the theses of Palmer and Hobsbawm as Eurotropic as well as Eurocentric, and argue that the Age of Revolutions is best understood in their words as a complex, broad, interconnected, and even global phenomenon. Others have insisted to insist, others have continued to insist that the French Revolution was at its heart and world historical. To conclude, despite these significant historiographical developments since he wrote, Rude's great books have been remarkably and deservedly influential, not only because of their combination of deep erudition and conceptual sweep, but also because of his capacity for lucid, coherent argument. He was a fine and unaffected stylist whose books remain a pleasure to read. His personal influence in Australia and elsewhere was profound. George was a charming, eloquent, generous man whose company and friendship were widely valued and whose decade in Australia and frequent visits thereafter created a rich legacy. In 1978, the first uh, biennial George Rude seminar was held in his honour at the University of Melbourne. We're now participating in the 22nd. His final visit to Australia coincided with that of Michel Vauvel in 1988 to the George Rude Seminar in the build-up to the bicentennial commemorations of 1989. It was an encounter that was both very moving and profoundly sad, uh, with obvious signs of the decline of George's health he died aged 82 in 1993. Thank you.